Good morning. Good morning. I welcome you to worship. Those of you that have gathered here in person today, as well as all of you who are joining us from home or wherever you may be tuning in from Facebook Live, we're glad to have us together joining as an, uh, one community for real worship today. So I invite you to listen now as we offer God the sculptor of the mountains, hymn number five. Hear the call to worship. This is the third week of our Lenten journey, and it's on this leg of the journey that we'll face our own greed and selfishness. It's on this journey that God will confront us. Our hearts are ready to receive God. So come then and let us move forward with Jesus ever closer to the cross. Let us faithfully and confidently follow Jesus. Please bow with me now for prayer. Lord, we come to you this day with so many things laying claim to our lives, our hearts, and our spirits. Open our ears and our hearts to hear your words of healing love and prepare us to be faithful disciples for you. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. I may have some young disciples just around the corner, but I'm going to jump to announcements in hopes. Oh, here they are. Good morning. Welcome. All right, so I have a question for you. The question is, does Jesus ever get angry? No. No? You sure? I got one particular story that we're going to look at today where he kind of gets bent out of shape. He goes to the temple, and he finds that they're doing things there that upset him. And so he 
makes up a little whip and he uses it to drive the sheep and the cattle out of the outer courts of the temple. And then he flips over the tables of the money changers. It upsets him that it looks like his uh, father's house has become a marketplace more than a house of prayer and worship. So while Jesus normally doesn't come across angry, in that case, he's pretty righteously angry because he sees his house, the house of his father being what he feels like being misused. So he calls people out over that. Um, does that justify us being angry? Maybe not, right? One, we're not Jesus, and two, we may not be righteous in our anger most of the time, right? It's good to know that Jesus, even if he does get upset, loves us and promises to be with us always and is always welcoming us even in our sinfulness, much like the father welcomed back the prodigal son. So you can always turn to him knowing that no matter what's going on in your life, he'll welcome you even though there are times that apparently he got steamed up a bit. All right, let's pray together. Thank you, God, for being with us and for Jesus' insistence that your house be a place of worship and his understanding that his own body was becoming the new temple whereby people could worship you directly in worshiping with him. Help us, God, to look to you and to share our love with you and with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A few announcements. We continue and invite you to our noontime call to prayer. If you can just take 10 minutes in the middle of your day to pray for our congregation, for our preschool, our local mission partners, our presbytery, the Senate, and the General Assembly. I can tell you that Helping Hand has had considerable need of their services since they've reopened. And so uh, if you are willing to donate food items, we have this cargo box in the, uh, out here in the parking lot to receive food donations throughout the week. I uh, also know that uh, Shepherd's Table has had to limit their ministry during the COVID crisis and it's been a struggle for them. So pray for them. If you have extra financial resources you'd like to make gifts to them, I'm sure it will help support their ministry during this difficult time. I also invite you to our Tuesday evening virtual Vespers. That's at 7.30 p.m. on Facebook Live. I remind you of the daily devotions that are available on your computer at d365.org, d365.org. And if you have prayer requests, if you'll make those known to us in the church office throughout the week, we will include them uh, to our prayer chain members, and we will also try to make sure we include them in the prayer concerns and joys that we share here on Sunday morning. Um, let me remind us that even extraordinary times like these, you are the church and I am the church and we are the church of Jesus Christ together. Even at a socially safe distance, the work of Christ goes forward. Um, say a few words about the Lenten journey. As we enter this third week in Lent, uh, we do begin to focus on things in the temple and what Jesus perceives as some greed and selfishness at play in the selling of um, sacrificial animals and exchanging coins for the proper coins to be used for making their, um, paying their taxes. And Jesus overturns the tables of the money changers and the sellers of sacrificial animals for he sees that they may have begun to exploit people for their own profit. And in his eyes, that's a corruption of the temple that was intended to be a house of worship. So he drives out the animals, he turns over the tables, demonstrating his disgust for how worship practices have drifted away from focus on God. Lent can be a time for us to do our own spiritual spring cleaning, to take a spiritual inventory, 
and to clean out those things that may be hindering us in our relationship with God, or perhaps to bring in things needed to draw us closer in our relationship with Jesus Christ. So we'll try to continue affirming one another as we work through this process of spring cleaning and growth throughout the remainder of Lent. Now let's say what we believe as we affirm our faith, we'll share together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I want to say uh, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper later in worship, and if you manage to get in without picking up one of the small bags that includes juice and a cracker, uh, please avail yourself to that now so that you'll have what you need just a little bit later in worship. And now as we prepare to share our joys and concerns in the time of prayer, I invite you to listen and meditate upon the words of hymn number 674, the first two verses, I call, O Lord, on you. news this week as we learned that Michael Brennan, the son of one of our choir members, died on a motorcycle on Friday morning. So we remember the family of Ryan Michael Brennan, age 42, who died in Myrtle Beach as a result of injuries sustained in a motorcycle accident on Friday, March 5th. Ryan is the son of Patty Rodriguez that has sung with us in the choir and Ryan leaves behind a wife, two daughters, and a son. We also lift up Donna Brockett White. She is in the final stages of life, moving towards death. She is the mother of Keith White, and she is in hospice care. We lift up all who are infected and battling the COVID-19 virus and all who are awaiting their vaccinations. We remember Dorothy Parker in physical rehab and are grateful that her brother has improved enough to be home from rehab. We lift up Kathy Harms, who's having several health issues, and Keith Harms, who is facing cancer surgery and recovery. Carol Mitchell asked prayer for her neighbor, Jesse Goldman. She's awaiting test results and also a two-year-old Asher Bruno, who's in Pennsylvania and may require a brain surgery coming up shortly. Please pray for Roger and Elaine Adams who have issues of health and safety. We lift up Jeff and Laureen Walsh's family for their health and wellness, and especially for Davis as he's continuing to recover from a recent spinal surgery. We continue to pray for Ariel Griffith, our local 13 year old who had a bad bout of COVID that led to the discovery that she has 
cancer and she's being treated for that and we're praying that she will receive total healing. We continue to lift up Ken, Chris and Diane Krenzer for their emotional and physical wellness and Chris's full recovery from his surgery and healing. We lift up Jim Cotter and pray his complete healing from his surgery back in January. We pray for Shirley Moore's complete healing and recovery from her surgery. We lift up Larry Talbot, brother-in-law of Terry Baker, as he's undergoing cancer treatment. We pray for Charles McFadden, a 15-year-old who's going to receive a heart transplant. We pray for that to be a successful procedure and for his full recovery. We continue to pray for Jesse Wallace for his full recovery and healing from shingles. We pray for Darren Hofert for his comfort and healing as he is battling stage four cancer. This is Robert and Rita Callender's nephew in England. We continue to pray for my cousin Madeline Dindy Tillis for her full recovery from traumatic brain injury. They're also seeking um, some outside resources, uh, a recovery facility to assist them in their care for her. We lift up prayers for our celebration, music director, accompanist search committee as we finalize our discerning process and move to hire someone new to lead us in worship music and the overall ministry of music here at Celebration. We also pray for our congregation, for the continued health and wellness of many who have done the right thing, staying in, staying safe, maintaining their distance and waiting for their vaccinations. We lift up our preschool staff and pray that they will be able to get their vaccinations now that the governor has opened it up for school teachers and for daycare workers and preschool staff. We pray for our students here and for their parents, for their health and wellness. Now I invite you to bow with me for prayer and to name those other concerns you are aware of as we look to God in prayer. Dear God, it seems like a lot of uncertainty around us. So many people who need our prayers. Today we pray for all who have suffered the loss of loved ones over this past year, especially for the family and friends of Ryan Brennan, whose untimely death has cast a pall of grief over our local community. We pray for those whose health is compromised by the coronavirus or other health issues. We pray for those who are suffering the economic impact of the virus in travel or manufacturing or hospitality, energy or so many other industries that have been affected by this virus. We pray for health care workers and first responders, teachers and other public servants who put themselves in harm's way day by day for the rest of us. We pray for the leaders of the world, for our country, our state, city and local leaders and pray that you give them wisdom to help manage this challenge. God, it can be overwhelming, but you tell us over and over again not to be afraid, to keep our eyes on you and to trust you in all things. Show us how to trust you more. Lord, sometimes we have difficulty hearing the story we'll hear later today of Jesus cleansing the temple of those who would lie and cheat and steal in your house. We prefer for Jesus to be patient, meek and mild, but there are many times when bold action is required to cleanse the cancer of greed and avarice from our lives. Lord, help us to remember that Jesus' patient words often fell upon deaf ears. Remind us that we need to be bold in our faith first examining our lives and clearing out the pain, greed, and fear. Replace our anxieties with confidence in your all-sustaining love and grace. Enable us to put our service to you and your people above our own selfishness. 
As we reach out to others in need, remind us that we also stand in need of your mercy and compassion every day. As we examine our hearts this Lenten season, help us to turn away from our concern with self and to turn our hearts, hands, and prayers and actions towards the needs and concerns of others. Now, Lord, listen to your children praying the prayer you taught your first disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to the time of receiving tithes and offerings, for those of you who are here, we have the clear plexiglass box at the back to receive your offerings. For those of you at home, you may mail or deliver your checks to the church office Monday through Thursdays, 9 to 2. Or you may use your online banking to have them direct your checks this way. Or you can go through the church website and use the Donate Now option or the recurring payment feature to make your tithes and offerings to celebration. We want to thank you for your ongoing generous generosity over this past year. You have sustained this ministry powerfully by your generosity, and we thank you. Now hear this invitation to the offering. God of grace, multiply the tithes and offerings among these people so that this church's ministry and mission may radically change lives and create new evangelism opportunities among us. We pray that these gifts may help all your children build a temple within their own body that brings honor and praise to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <coughs>
Join me as we dedicate our offerings with prayer. For the blessings of this day and all our days, we thank you, gracious God. Except we pray not just the money we give, but also our lives freely offered in gratitude for all that you have done for us. Use them both in this place and wherever you might take us for your glory in Christ's name. Amen like to thank D.L. and Rhonda for their musical offering this morning. Our scripture lesson for today comes from John's gospel. We leave the gospel of Mark and go to chapter 2 of John's gospel, and I invite you to prepare your hearts and minds to hear and receive God's word with a few moments of silence, followed by a prayer for illumination. Since we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth, make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. And may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Listen now, hear the gospel lesson from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables, making a whip of cords. Jesus drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to Jesus, What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then the Jews said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Let's spend a few moments together thinking about what it means to Turn the tables and do some serious house cleaning with Jesus. And it's important to put this in context, for unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
the three Gospels that are known as the Synoptic Gospels because they all follow a very similar timeline and storyline for the story of Jesus. John does a very different thing. His Gospel story, his timeline has Jesus attending Passover in Jerusalem at the beginning of his public ministry, just after his first miracle where he changed water into wine at a wedding celebration in Cana of Galilee. And it points up to us that the week of Jesus' death was not his first Passover shared with his disciples. Also for John, Jesus' cleansing of the temple happens here, very early in his public ministry, setting the money changers and sacrifice sellers and Jewish religious authorities who were profiting from temple business against this man named Jesus from very early on. They were upset with him for messing up the temple or church as they knew it and the business that they had come to be accustomed to. What we see is the Lord Jesus in an angry rage. We don't see him that way very often, but he's upset and he makes a whip and he drives the animals out of the temple area. He flips over the table, sending coins scattering across the temple court. His righteous anger is focused against the money-making activities going on in the temple courtyard and his desire to reach his Jewish brothers and sisters and to restore their piety, to restore them to their proper worship. The celebration of Passover brought many observant Jews from all over the region to Jerusalem and to the temple. Pilgrims eager to make their required sacrifices and pious offerings in order to assure their good standing in the eyes of God and the Jewish religious community came to the temple and they did what was necessary there to make their proper offerings. The animals and birds for sale in this outer courtyard known as the, the Gentile courtyard made it unnecessary for them to have to bring their animals for sacrifice on the long journey from wherever home was to Jerusalem. Instead, they could purchase those items at the temple site itself. And in a similar way, the money changers were there and took in coins of all sorts from wherever their region was and would exchange them for the only accepted currency in the temple, which was a Tyrian shekel. That way they could pay their annual temple tax in the only way it would be acceptable. The entrepreneurs there in the court of the Gentiles, the animal sellers and money changers alike, weren't breaking any laws. In fact, they felt like they were serving the greater good by providing this practical service to others who were coming from far off to do their worship in Jerusalem. But the reality of the situation was that it had become a bit of a commercial ripoff. It was detracting from the worshipful nature of this place, the temple, which was built and being rebuilt as the house of God. The sounds and smells of the animals filled the air. The bantering and bargaining between sellers and buyers snuffed out much of the sense of the spiritual. The outer temple courtyard space that had intentionally been aside, set aside for Gentiles to be included in prayer was overtaken by this economic activity that was necessary. Gentiles, those ancestors of ours, they were the non-Jews whose faith was determined not by birthright but by a personal spiritual yearning to be a part of the worship in the temple and a willingness to draw near to God and make the proper means and sacrifices that were required of all Jewish worshipers or Gentiles who were seeking to worship there as well. All these exchanges of money were making the temple establishment and those that handled the transactions rich. So it was becoming more and more like a marketplace 
and less and less like a house of worship. So on this day, it hit Jesus, and it hit him wrong, and it made him angry, and it became time to clean house, to slough off the old system, and to seek to discover a deeper layer of meaning, of exploration and growth in his father's house. His actions and his words not only take back a temple courtyard for the Gentiles to gather and pray, his words and actions also point a new way forward to a fundamental change in the relationship between God and God's people. No longer will their atonement for sin have to be repeatedly purchased by their money offerings and their blood sacrifices of animals. Jesus' very presence at the temple, the mission he is living, declares a new reality of God's new plan and purpose. When the Jews who witnessed Jesus' rowdy righteousness demand him to back up his actions with some sort of sign, his response is cryptic, and it's so unusual that it stayed in the minds and the hearts of those who heard him say, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Many of them were concrete thinkers like us. What they heard, they took at face value, and they thought to themselves, this temple is so big, so heavy, so well constructed, how will you tear it down and rebuild it in such a short time? But Jesus was pointing to himself as the new temple. He was the final sacrifice. His sacrifice would lead to the destruction of death that would be accomplished by his own death and ultimately his resurrection. And through that, it would restore relationship between God and all creation. Jesus was breaking old things down and revealing to them a new way of being in right relationship with God, a relationship that was already under construction. But it mystified most of the crowd. They weren't making sense of it. But as we know from our own experience of cleaning in our homes or in our workplaces, it's not something you can do once and be done with, as much as I'd like to think that you could do it once. My mom had a, a, a phrase. She said, if you move it, you have to dust everything. Because as long as you didn't move something on the shelf, you couldn't tell that there was dust. But the minute you moved one item, then you had to get out the dust claws and go to work. Dust and dirt happen on a regular basis. Our bodies need to be washed regularly. Our clothes have to be cleaned. Dishes must be attended to regularly or they pile up. Clutter happens and it continues to happen until we take time to conquer it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke in their gospels all record Jesus having this cleansing of the temple at the end of his ministry. And in fact, many scholars say it had to happen that way because once he messed with the money, he had signed his own death warrant. Once he took matters in his own hands, it was only a short matter of time before he would die. So why does John veer off in a different way and have the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and mission? Well, John's placement early in Jesus' ministry lets us consider, again, the recurring necessity of cleansing, the importance of reclaiming the temple from chaos time and again. Jesus clears out the temple courtyard, but it's unlikely that it remained cleaned out for very long. Most likely, once Jesus left the temple, those people fell right back in where they were, money changers, sellers of livestock, and business picked up as usual. The description of these two different cleansing scenes, one at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and one near the end, remind all of the gospel readers that such house cleaning is necessary 
And it's a regular ritual that we have to keep. John alludes to a scripture way back in Zechariah chapter 14, 21, that says, and there shall be, and there shall no longer be traitors in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. And this is partly what Jesus is quoting when he comes in and becomes so disgusted with things. Now that Jesus has come, God is spirit and those who will worship God will worship God in spirit and in truth, in the person and in the presence of Jesus Christ. The focus will become on him, not on a building, not on the temple itself. During Lent, a lot of Christians still symbolically talk about giving up something. And maybe you've picked out your thing that you're giving up and you're working at it over the 40 days so that it can deepen your relationship with God and bring you to a, a deeper celebration of the resurrection on Easter. Some give up meat, others sweets, some television, others alcohol, some try to give up negativity, others even give up Twitter and Facebook for the 40 days. The point is we voluntarily choose to clean up or give up some part of our ordinary lives in order to let ourselves be more uh, vulnerable, deepened in our relationship with God. And the way that happens that each time we feel that craving stir up within us for whatever it is we've given up, it's intended to be an impulse to take us closer to Christ. When you think of the craving, you move towards Christ. When you sense that urge, you call on Christ. And in order to get through it, you have to keep calling on Christ and it hopefully deepens your walk with him. Every craving temptation should draw us to Christ. And if you're cleansing your temple, your mind, your body, your spirit, through some daily act, then there should be daily renewal happening for you. A daily encounter with a new perspective, a daily experience of drawing closer to Jesus and understanding more fully his sacrifice for you and for me. The extent that he was willing to go to, offering up his very life to show us the extent of God's love. Lent is a time for such external and internal cleansing. It's a time for seeking, asking for God's help to wash away the built up layers of everyday sin within our lives, to help soften our hardened hearts or lengthen our shortened tempers or help us overcome self-absorption and greed and gluttony, envy or anger or anything else that draws our attention away from God's good purpose and plan for our lives. As Jesus cleansed the temple and reclaimed it as a house of God for prayer and worship, so too our Lenten disciplines can daily have us reclaiming our hearts and our homes and our churches as centers of God's presence and power and we submit to that and say, be the Lord of this temple. Be in charge, God. Take hold of me at a deeper level. Remember back as far as his birth when we heard Jesus named Emmanuel, God with us. He was pointing to himself as the new temple. He is God with us. He remains not only with us but for us as the living temple and by his body broken our salvation has been secured and by his blood poured out our sins have been washed white as snow and by his resurrection he has put death to death for all time and to that i say how good of god and thanks be to god now we're going to transition to the Lord's table. And let us share this good news at God's table as we partake once more 
of Jesus' body and blood broken and poured out for you and for me and for the world and for all eternity. And we're going to sing again. you to come to this table, not because you must, but because you may, not because you're strong, but because you're weak. Come not because of any goodness of your own that gives you a right, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would love to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. I remind us that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he was gathered in the upper room with his disciples, and they had celebrated the Passover meal together. They had celebrated what it meant to be set free out of bondage in Egypt a message that they passed on to the generations, that they never wanted to be in captivity again. They wanted to be the free people of God. From that table, Jesus took elements that were present, but he transformed their meaning when he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the meal, he took the cup and having blessed it, he said, this cup represents the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. And he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death until I come again. 
Friends, this is the feast of God for the family of God. Thank Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray together. Humbly we come at your invitation, acknowledging our own sinfulness and brokenness, and yet sim sensing the warmth of your welcome, the depth of your grace, the fullness of your forgiveness, the lasting nature of your love. We are drawn and compelled to come to this table and to share this feast that you have prepared. We ask that you would take now these common elements of bread and juice that this may be for us a celebration of holy communion with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, in your Ziploc bag, you have got a gluten-free cracker. And I invite you to break it and eat it in remembrance of Christ. You also have a small container of juice. And the lid will peel back on that. I invite us to drink this cup in remembrance of Christ's blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Thanks be to God. Now pray with me. Gracious God, as we have received these gifts of bread and wine, you have fed us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for assuring us of your goodness and love and that we are members of his body. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now I invite you to listen to the message and the words of hymn 515, I Come With Joy.
Just a few reminders, um, mainly that you can continue the Lenten journey on Tuesday evenings at 7.30 p.m. for virtual Vespers, and then again on Sunday mornings, either in person here at 11 or through Facebook Live at 11 a.m. Now hear this charge and bear it out in your life. Friends, as we prepare to take what we've heard and shared back into our homes, back into the world, we should understand that we can never permit buildings or symbols or signs or organizations or traditions or customs or liturgies or rituals or any of the features of church life or worship to become substitutes for our real devotion to Jesus Christ himself. All these activities in themselves can become too important. When we worship God in spirit and in truth, we know God's real presence in us and among us in the risen Christ. And we dramatize that when we come together for worship and when we go out into the world to follow him and serve him among our neighbors and especially among the most needy of our neighbors. Now receive this benediction. Go forth into the world with compassion and justice in your heart. Give voice to the silent. Give strength to the weak. Hear one another. See one another. Care for one another and love one another. It's all that easy and it's all that hard. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.